Mr. Mayor and, and Commissioner Bernard will be joining us shortly. Uh, Commissioner Baxter, uh, let me know that you not able to return this afternoon. So we'll go ahead and get started since we're all here. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Commissioners, uh, Madam Administrator. I uh, also want to thank uh, Mr. David Bahar from the dais as well, who is our attorney assigned to public safety and worked with us uh, through a lot of um, different issues in our department. I'm joined today by um, Stephanie Shanahar, our director of public safety, uh, Mary Blakeney, who's our director of emergency management, um, Dan Koenig, who's our senior manager of the Division of 911 Program Services, and we're here to partly provide you with our annual overview as we uh, start to enter the hurricane season. I know we don't want to say that word publicly, but that's what we kind of time this to make sure that this is one, an opportunity for you to understand um, our readiness as a county uh, as we face uh, potential you know, issues uh, here locally and throughout the state. Um, as well as to use it as an opportunity uh, to allow that communication and that messaging to begin and to uh, reiterate that with our public so that they understand uh, what they need to do and the precautions and the resources and the tools that we have available uh, to make sure that they're prepared for our um, upcoming storm season or any other disasters that might uh, strike our community or our whereabouts. And in addition, uh, Dan is with us today as well. Um, he is one of our experts in 911, and he and Stephanie are going to provide a little deeper dive into our county 911 program. Um, it's pretty impressive, I think, some of the work that they've done and the readiness with that system, and wanted to just share some of that with you as well, so you just kind of understand how that flows. So I'm going to turn some things over to Stephanie to get us started and um, look forward to the presentation. Thank you, Todd. So our agenda today um, includes the emergency management overview. We're also going to talk about our 12 core hazards that we deal with, and we're going to provide an overview of our 2022 hurricane season and what 2023 is going to look like for us this year. Also, we're going to get into our preparedness cycle, as well as Todd mentioned, our 911 system overview. And then also at the end, how can you help as commissioners? So it's all about teamwork when it comes to the Division of Emergency Management. Our vision is to be a world-class emergency management agency, keeping our community safe and resilient by working together with our partners and the public as a team. We are blessed to have the support and resources of all of Palm Beach County to help us plan, respond, and recover from disasters. We rely on county departments as well as numerous state, federal, and nonprofit volunteer agencies to help us prepare, respond, and recover from major disasters. Now I'd like to turn it over to Mary Blakeney, and she's going to go into a deep dive into uh, the agenda for today uh, under the Division of Emergency Management. Mary? So we're not just the hurricane people at Emergency Management. We spend our year addressing core hazards, which include natural hazards, technological hazards, and human-caused hazards by planning with stakeholder agencies, training responders and county employees, and exercising our entire emergency management system. Our structure is designed around being the, the organizing agency for communication, coordination, and collaboration. Yet, we know this time of year, with the upcoming hurricane season, everyone's mind is on hurricanes, so let's take, take some time to discuss what we can all do to be prepared. To start off, we are fortunate that we've been the host location for the Governor's Hurricane Conference since 2017 and will remain the host location at least through 2026. This year, the conference offered 33 training sessions, 59 workshops, a robust vendor exhibit hall, and keynote speakers from local, state, and federal agencies. The conference had over 2,600 attendees this year, many of which were from our own community. The training sessions covered in topics such as exercise design, EOC management, EOC functions, mitigation for emergency managers, recovery funding, and even emergency operations center tours that featured our own Palm Beach County EOC. The workshops were set in one and a half hour sessions, and best practices and lessons learned were distributed from individuals and organizations with real world experience. 
These workshops focused on debris, improving funding outcomes, disaster feeding, stress management for responders, improving coordination with energy providers, communicating through crisis, community outreach and education, private sector response, and much more. These training sessions were attended by representatives of two additional countries, 31 states around the United States, and 63 of the 67 counties within the state of Florida. So 2022, was 2022 was focused was focused to be an above average year for hurricane season and Palm Beach County was impacted by these events having activated the EOC for both hurricanes Ian and Nicole the 2022 season saw five landfalling hurricanes along the US mainland two of the landfalls being hurricane Ian which, was which is tied as the fifth strongest hurricane ever to make landfall in the US, causing 156 deaths and a rare late storm with Hurricane Nicole making landfall on November 10th in North Hutchison Island. This year, the National Hurricane Center has predicted 14 to 18 named storms, seven to nine hurricanes, and two to four intense hurricanes but it only takes just one. We need to be prepared. We need to be ready to respond every day of the year, regardless of the seasonal forecast and regardless of the hazard. Last year, I shared the shocking statistic from the National Hurricane Center that there have been 16 hurricanes that have made landfall in the US since 2017, with eight being major. This past year increased the statistic to 19 hurricanes making landfall in the U.S. since 2017, and nine of those were major hurricanes. With the nation's strongest storms of 150 miles per hour or greater, all but one were tropical storms three, day before, three days before landfall, three days before they became major, major hurricanes. As witnessed last year, Hurricane Ian made landfall 61 hours after becoming a hurricane. The average time of these storms becoming a hurricane is 50 hours before landfall. And the impacts of these storms are felt well before landfall, sometimes 12 hours in advance. This is why preparedness can't wait. As we learn from our partners at the National Weather Service in Miami, preparedness can't wait because as you will see, over an 11 year time frame, South Florida became known as hurricane country. Palm Beach County has been extremely lucky, but luck runs out and our residents need to know if they live within a hurricane evacuation zone. Our residents need to know their zone. So to clarify, we issue evacuation orders due to anticipated storm surge, not wind. The only exception is for people living in manufactured homes. Storm surge is the rising coastal water associated with tropical cyclones. Storm surge is the abnormal rise of water beyond that of high tide, which is pushed by the storm towards the shore and it piles up along the coast. This rise in water level can cause extreme flooding in coastal areas, particularly when storm surge coincides with normal high tides resulting in storm tides which could reach up to six to nine feet in Palm Beach County. Most casualties during tropical cyclones occur as a result of storm surge and flooding. So contrary to popular, popular belief, we evacuate the coastal regions for storm surge, not because of wind speeds. In general, high winds do not lead the it do not lead to casualties in storms. Rather, nearly half of all fatalities attributed to cyclones is caused by storm surge and inland flooding. This is why we say, hide from the wind, run from the water. To actually see storm surge impacts, we want to show a video of a storm surge coming on to Fort Myers Beach, September 28th, 2022. Some of you have may, maybe have seen this video, but we wanted to, to share this. <clears throat> And as pointed out during the, the governor's hurricane conference by deputy director of the National Hurricane Center, Jamie Rome, if you look at the windows in this house, the shades are moving because there's people inside. 
if you look at that coral colored house. To give you a little perspective of that house as you watch it, um, it was sitting on eight foot tall pilings. This was this was Fort Myers Beach yeah, last year. It's pretty powerful. This was actually shot by a storm chaser that attached their GoPro to a piling in that area and just let it sit there during the storm surge. So how they got that's how we. That's how it was captured. Yeah, it was on a GoPro. So this video really demonstrates the importance why we issue evacuation orders and why people should take action and evacuate. When a storm is approaching, it is important to remain aware of each and every forecast change. We urge residents not to anchor decisions based off of old forecasts. Slight shifts, or often called wiggles, in a forecast can drastically affect impacts in our community. As shown in this diagram, a 20 mile shift prior to landfall can change the impacts of the landfall location by hundreds of miles. This is why it's important not to focus on the cone. The cone only shows an area where the eye could make landfall. Risk can happen hundreds of miles away from the, the cone based on the size of the storm or hundreds of miles away from the eye. Being informed at all times is important because forecasts change. Based on the track, intensity, and expected surge of an approaching storm, we have the ability to select which evacuation zones are ordered to evacuate. In Palm Beach County, we have six evacuation zones. Zone A consists of residents living within manufactured or mobile homes, those that live in flood prone areas, and those who have substandard construction, for example, if they know their roof is compromised. Zone B through E are coastal areas or areas impacted by inland flooding due to storm surge being pushed into inland waterways. Zone L is located around Lake Okeechobee and would be evacuated in the event there would be models forecasting overtopping of water over the dike surrounding the lake. Our residents need to know today if they live in a hurricane evacuation zone. If you are told to evacuate, you need to take immediate action and do so. There will be a point in time where normal emergency response agencies will stop due to the hazards contained within the storm. We have the ability in Palm Beach County to open 15 general population risk shelters, two special needs shelter locations, and two pet friendly shelter locations. Our residents should listen to announcements for shelter openings as all shelter locations may not be opened. Special needs shelters are for residents with certain medical situations. These shelters require residents pre-register and have a caregiver. To register, residents can complete an online application at readypbc.com or contact emergency management at 561-712-6400. For residents required to evacuate who have a pet, they can pre-register for the pet-friendly shelter directly through Animal Care and Control 
or visit readypbc.com for more information. Even with our robust preparedness measures, our residents rely on us for emergency shelters as well as other countywide disaster functions that are a critical component in our emergency response system. The Employee Disaster Rep Response Program, also known as EDRP, assists with identifying county employees and their skill sets and matching them with pre-disaster related roles, with disaster related roles. The EDRP can be used for any type of hazard or emergency and provides clear assignments and training to our employees. The breakdown of county employees is shown on the table on the screen. While we have over 3,900 employees with department-specific disaster responsibilities as part of their job, we currently have close to 1,400 employees enrolled and trained to serve our community in a variety of disaster essential roles. Within the EDRP program, essential staff continue to have vital disaster responsibilities. Some examples of department essential staff include water utility plant operators who maintain critical water utilities operations before, during, and after a storm has passed, fire rescue staff who continue to respond until it is no longer safe to do so, and then resume operations immediately when winds subside. Facilities Development and Operations staff who prepare our county facilities for the approaching storm, ensure critical systems are operational during the storm, and immediately conduct damage assessment after the storm. Planning, zoning, and building staff who are staged and ready to conduct immediate damage assessments <coughs> when safe to do so, and engineering staff conducting what we call initial first push of debris from our roads, ensure bridges are operational, and resume operations of countywide traffic signals. For shelter staffing, currently there are 67 shelter supervisors and 595 shelter support staff. The diagram to the right on the screen shows the organizational structure in place for supporting general population shelters. Sheltering does not just involve county staff. Other agencies, such as the healthcare district, Department of Health in Palm Beach County, the Palm Beach County School District, Palm Beach County and Municipal Fire Rescue Agencies are all assigned to fill vital shelter roles as well. This is a countywide team effort to ensure our community is safe in time of disasters. How we have been preparing during the non-hurricane season, which is December through May, is through our planning, training, and exercise cycle. As part of the plan, train, exercise, and evaluation cycle, the Division of Emergency Management has sponsored and conducted more than 41 training classes, having trained over 880 students in courses such as Administration and Finance Section Chief, Community Emergency Response Team, which is CERT, Teen CERT, Immediate EOC Functions, Logistics Section Chief, Management of Spontaneous Volunteers, <coughs> Mitigation, Rapid Needs Assessment, Situation Unit, Shelter Operations Training, and Incident Command System Training. In addition to our sponsored training courses, we encourage all community partners to participate in various FEMA online study courses, which has contributed to 87% of our EOC staff having completed basic national incident management training courses. In addition to exercising locally developed plans, we regularly convene with all of the emergency managers around the state through conference calls, webinars, statewide and regional meetings, or by attending conferences such as the Governor's Hurricane Conference to discuss lessons learned and best practices being implemented statewide. As a community, we need to encourage our residents to be ready for the unexpected and educate them about preparedness programs and basic actions they can take. On average, each month, our emergency management staff reach over 100 people directly through our preparedness presentations, approximately 32,000 hits on our website, and 24,000 connections through our social media. But this is just a small number of people we directly address. We need everyone, including you, to strongly encourage everyone to be pre prepared, personally and professionally. So please take every opportunity to encourage your staff, family members, friends, and your constituents to be prepared. 
Our message is basically very simple. Help us spread the word. Make a plan, build a kit, get involved, and be informed. In order to make a plan, as part of their plan, they should know their zone and know their home. If you live in an evacuation zone, you need to evacuate if told to do so. Know where you're going if officials order an evacuation. Preference would be that you stay with family or friends within the county. How will you get there? Where is the meeting place for your family and friends? Do you have a plan for your pets or anyone in your family that may have special needs? If you plan to stay at home, shutter and stay in place. In order to make a plan, if your plan is to shelter in place, make sure you know your home, understand when your home was built, and check on any additional, additional mitigation measures that you can do to secure your home. For example, impact windows, shutters, roof reinforcement bracing, water drainage, or garage doors. Also conduct an insurance checkup to make sure you have adequate coverage. Know where your important documents are at. Should you be sheltering in place, understand there are a number of indirect fatalities as a result of hurricanes. The largest number of these deaths are due to heart attacks and power problems. If you're using a generator, make sure it is maintained and operational, then keep it outside, away from exterior doors, windows, and vents, and keep it dry. These are items to plan for and consider when making your family plan. Also, you need to build a kit and keep it stocked year round. Plan for a five to seven day supply of shelf stable items. This kit does not need to be expensive. You can purchase an extra can or two each time you go to the store and keep them in your pantry. Plan for canned food and snacks. Don't forget your can opener. As for water, you should plan for one gallon per person per day. This water can be collected using existing containers that you have directly with water from your faucets. Prescription and over-the-counter medication, flash, flashlights, battery-powered radio and extra batteries, personal hygiene supplies, baby items, pet items, paper products and plastic utensils, cash and important documents. But you also need to plan to get involved. There are several ways you can get involved in community preparedness, response, and recovery. Volunteer with community groups in your community and check on your neighbors. With so many new people moving to our county, get to know your neighbors and help us educate them about preparedness. Some things you can do to help your neighbors are to collect supplies from emergency kits, install shutters, or help them evacuate if told to do so. After a storm, check on your neighbors who may be living alone or are elderly and may need assistance. You can help them by assisting them with removing shutters, sharing supplies and resources, and cleaning up debris from their yards. But it's also important to stay informed. Sign up for Alert PBC, download the Palm Beach County Dart app, monitor local media, our website, and our social media for preparedness information and protective actions. Forecasts change. Do not lock into that one forecast. Continuously be informed and understand how you could personally be impacted. Our website, readypbc.com, is filled with valuable resources on preparedness information and tips. This information is available to anyone and everyone who would like to share these preparedness messages with their family, friends, neighbors, and coworkers. This past year, our website had over 46,000 hits, and we had over 1 million connections through our social media site. In addition to our website, we have a convenient phone app called PBC Dart. PBC Dart provides valuable information and resources at your fingertips. This smartphone application has evacuation zones, shelter information, damage assessment information, and many other features to help you before, during, and after a storm. All of the previous preparedness information is great to prepare you for a storm and guide you in advance if you need to evacuate. Palm Beach County also has a system in place called Alert PBC, which allows you to opt in to receive public safety notifications via phone calls, text messages, or emails. 
Alert PBC allows us to alert you of public safety issues in your community, such as hazardous weather conditions. When we issue a notification about a potential safety hazard or concern, you will receive a message on the voice, text, or email communication method that you have registered for. The information you provide is protected and will not be used for any other purpose. Residents can sign up for this free service by visiting alertpbc.com. Last year, more than 3,300 individuals registered for Alert PBC out of the 33,000 total registered. In total, we sent out vital information 93 times to more than 1.5 million contact numbers. I would now like to turn it back over to Stephanie. Thank you, Mary. So during disasters, emergencies can happen. So it's important to know who to call and when and in order to keep the 911 phone lines available. 911 is used for life and death emergencies. So what happens when you have to call emergency services? While there may be 16 public safety answering points, otherwise known as a PSAP or a 911 call center across the county, they may operate, they operate under a single system. All 911 calls are answered first by a law enforcement agency. Medical emergencies are when you may need immediate transportation to the hospital. This may be due to chest pains, difficulty breathing, stroke, severe bleeding, a sudden onset of pain or inability to move. Police emergencies would include incidents like a crime in progress, a car crash, or suspicious persons. Fire emergencies would include a fire, smoke, or a smell of smoke or gas. There are a few of the more common reasons, these are a few more of the common reasons to call 911. If you are unable to call 911 due to medical issues, physical injuries, or if speaking would put you in danger, you can text to 911. Text to 911 may also work when signals are too weak for a phone call, but call if you can. Our message is very simple. Call if you can, text if you can't. Only call 911 when emergency help is needed immediately or you are in fear of your personal safety. Do not call 911 for information related to, to the storm. As Mary said earlier, call the Emergency Information Center at 561-712-6400 for storm-related resources. Palm Beach County operates an integrated next-generation 911 system. Our NG911 system has policies and routing features built in the system to ensure 911 calls are answered by a 911 public safety telecommunicator <coughs> located in one of the 16 PSAPs here in Palm Beach County. We have 13 primary, which is answered by law enforcement first, and three secondary PSAPs, which would receive the transfer of the call, and that's Palm Beach County Fire Rescue, our Florida Atlantic University Police Department, and most recently our Florida Highway Patrol located in Lake Worth. So Palm Beach County's Division of 911 Program Services is involved with the call as soon as the caller dials the last one in 911. The short code 911 triggers different handling of the call. Wireline calls go to a phone company's central office and wireless calls are routed through the cell tower system. The main difference between a phone call and a 911 call is location and data delivered with the call. Palm Beach County 911 Program Services is responsible for getting the, call, the 911 call from the caller to the correct public safety answering point, otherwise known as 911 call center, for appropriate emergency response if needed. For example, while West Palm Beach is a large area, we ensure that calls within the city boundaries are delivered to the West Palm Beach Police Department and calls that are within unincorporated West Palm Beach are delivered to Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. If a 911 call can't be answered at the intended location, it will ring at a predetermined backup location. This could be due to call volume, availability of call takers and or equipment, even the evacuation of a 911 center due to a storm or other emergency conditions. Many other precautions are in place to ensure the 911 system is available and resilient. This includes on-site generators, battery backups, geodiverse location of our equipment, and prioritize networks and circuits. Mm -hmm. Palm Beach County 911 also maintains a cache of over 50 laptops 
that are set up to answer 911 calls from any remote location if the situation di dictates such as an evacuation of a PSAP. Now I'd like to turn it over to, dis to Todd to discuss how you can help. So oftentimes we're asked, you know, how can we help? We hear that from, you know, members of the Board of County Commissioners, from resources in the community, from other elected officials. I think you, many of you are familiar with our structure at the Emergency Operation Center and how we operate when we activate with an incident commander and key components of our personnel that are staged in areas of their expertise to do that. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about some of the things that we often call upon our, our elected officials and more specifically uh, the Board of County Commissioners to work with us um, when we uh, activate for a storm both pre and post. So first I just wanted to share kind of that prioritization role when we are at the Emergency Operation Center and the priorities that we take when responding to an incident that happens. I mean, first and foremost is always life safety issues. That is priority number one. So when we have those opportunities, whether it's a high hazard um, area or a high risk populations or a search and rescue mission, those are going to take priority number one from a response priority. Number two is establishing communications. Um, you probably see that we have a lot of items that become before this board about communications, both with our municipalities, the county, and other important organizations. A lot of that is about creating that you know, communication realm in the event that you've got a lot of systems that are down. Then the priority three is those mission critical operations that we work on, and a lot of those are some sort of basic human needs. Then the next stage after that from a priority, prioritization is mission critical for infrastructure, things like roads and that important schools or businesses that we need to get cleared or get reopened again. And then finally, some of the environmental um, hazard mitigations. So as elected uh, leaders of the county, we look to you to reinforce a lot of those actions and a lot of those prioritizations that have been designated uh, by this board um, over you know, decades and decades of work and refining um, what we do, and also to manage some of those community expectations. I mean, when Mary talked about the kits and what we need to put together, I mean, those are real expectations that we need to set out there. You know, storms happen. It's not easy, as you saw that video of storm surge from Fort Myers Beach, to be boots on the ground the next day or the day after to do some of those kinds of things. So we've got to maintain some of that expectation. And in terms of the role, I mean, we spend a lot of time working with our legislative delegation, our federal delegation as well, and kind of putting these pieces together. Um, obviously, some of you more recently than others have experienced some of these in your individual districts, smaller size emergencies that Vice Mayor Sachs, you know, responded to with um, tornadoes in her district, Commissioner Marino responded to as well recently on a smaller scale. That conduit to the, of that information, that go-between to a number of different stakeholders within your districts is extremely important to us on the communication level. It's the same way when we have federal declarations. A lot of times you are the ones getting the calls from our members of Congress, from their chiefs of staff, from the governor's office and legislators, and trying to communicate that message of what some of those needs are that we currently have. Uh, working with our federal delegation to turn on the FEMA um, resources and programs and some of those special requests for different support. Uh, we'll work to help coordinate that messaging. Our public affairs office does an excellent job uh, working with the incident commander and administration to put those things together and then you can utilize that information in a concerted effort uh, to do that. We like to uh, reinforce some of the proactive actions as well as to reinforce the importance of consistent public information um, items and messaging uh, when we get that out because really what people are looking for is accurate information, the most up-to-date information that we can pro possibly provide uh, for many of our residents and folks that are in need of some type of resource in these difficult times. Um, it is our hope this year in 2023 that we will have a quiet hurricane season. Um, so we'll keep our fingers crossed, but we certainly are here to say that our guard is not down. Our community should not let their guard down. Um, the state will not let their guard down. Um, that was a big part of what you just witnessed here with the governor's hurricane conference. That community of individuals together, knowing that individually we can't 
respond to the biggest of disasters. Collectively, we can, though. And that resources is there. And our team is a huge part of what we see. And I just wanted to thank, I know a couple of our team members are here with us in the audience. Chief Kennedy and his fire rescue team, um, Richard Radcliffe and our emergency managers and those professionals that were in constant communication. They're just a small part of that bigger team that we rely on to make sure that our community knows that we are ready. Um, and we thank them and we also thank you for your time today and we are happy to answer any questions that you might have about our 911 system or any response to hurricanes or any other disaster. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Are there any questions from the board? Commissioner Woodward, you're recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you for this presentation. It's uh, my first season in this office. I, I hope we have fish storms, if anything, uh, nothing mm -hmm. lands here. But uh, I would just like to say, I know we have a lot of new residents that have moved to Florida. I, I have brand new neighbors myself who've never experienced hurricane season. So this information is uh, super valuable. And um, I'm assuming uh, public relations can make it available for us to add to newsletters and um, to send out on social media posts. So like, especially with the kits. And uh, also for people to know their zones and to I, you mentioned it not to evacuate out of state necessarily. Um, I know that's a, a reaction a lot of people have. Oh, a storm's coming, we must go to Georgia or something. And we can plan to evacuate tens of miles or within the county or other locations. And I did have the, the honor to go into the Hurricane Hunter airplane uh, that was here to see all the technology that's used to uh, inform us and when we make these decisions and i know many of you were there to see that uh, it's valuable information um, but we do need um, our citizens and ourselves to be prepared so the kits are important and uh, for people to realize this is sort of the price of living in this paradise that we have to be ready for storms like this hopefully we don't have to but um, i'd like to be able to inform everyone they do have a responsibility themselves to be prepared with food, water, and, and to know whether or not they should evacuate. That's a horrifying image. Hopefully we never have storm surge like that on this side of Florida. But uh, if we do, um, we will work together. And I know the state's a really good partner. We've, we've managed multiple storms in the past. And I'm very honored here that Palm Beach County does a great job. And I would just like to be able to share all of this in, in maybe a few different ways with uh, constituents, especially all of our new residents, because they will either panic or buy a case of beers and they'll celebrate, and, you know. <laughs> either way, it's, uh, it's information that people should have. So thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, I'm not seeing anything else, but thank you again. Thank you for all you guys do all year long. But as, as we know, June 1st is the official start of hurricane season that begins next week. Perfect timing, and uh, as you say, it's important to not to panic, but just to be prepared. Take advantage of some of those sales tax opportunities as well to prepare for yet? a storm, yeah. storm season. Hasn't been signed yet, but it is scheduled to start very soon. So as soon as that is signed, we'll get a list of all of those items up that can be available, everything from flashlights to $3,000 generators, uh, big savings that you can get, and there'll be two opportunities to do that, but better to do it at the beginning of hurricane season. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Marino, you're recognized. It's funny, I'm, Mary, you said it earlier about you know containers at home for your water, and uh, actually did a little PSA for the Palm Beach North Chamber. I took every single container that I had in my house, whether it was a really large, you know, um, water pitcher or a large Yeti thermos or whatever, and they just lined the cabinet. And then, you know, it's like, why go out and buy bottled water and add to worry about recycling and adding to the trash when you have all of this at home that you can do? And you, you can fill up your bathtubs. And if you have a pool, you can do that. Make sure, also make sure that if you have a grill and you have a gas grill, that you have your gas tank full so that you have the food that's in the refrigerator that's going to go bad. If you lose your power, you can do it. You can, you know, use your gas grill. So there are a lot of things. And I'm, you know, I, I also, by the way, have the Dart app on my phone. So if you want to send that off to your constituents too, okay, perfect. You know, we, there are a lot of ways to get information out. Just thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So moving on, we're going to get a, a, a briefing on facilities development and operations.
Good afternoon. Good um, afternoon. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. It's Samia Jala, Director of Facilities Development and Operations. With me today is uh, here is Eric McClellan, Director of FDO's Strategic Planning Division, and Perby Bogaida, Director of FDO's Property and Real Estate Management Division. Today, it's our pleasure to provide you a brief overview of facilities development and operations, what, who we are, and what we do. Simply put, FDO is an internal services provider. Uh, we are that department within the county's organizational structure that provides the services required to keep all other departments and constitutional offices in operation, thereby assisting them to achieve their mission. I often say that we are the department meant to be behind the curtains, ensuring that the county's building systems, fleet, radio, security, and other key functions operate correctly. We have about 392 positions, manage an operational budget of approximately $84 million, and a capital budget of approximately $139 million. Our department is comprised of seven divisions, and we are one of the county's five construction departments. This slide is only meant to provide you a visual overview of how FDO is structured. As can be seen on the next slide, our workforce is diverse, and many of our employees have worked for the county well over 15 to 20 years. Hence, as you can see, we are in a transition process. As a significant number of our colleagues approach retirement age, uh, we have a wave of new employees uh, joining our team. As stated before, FDO has seven divisions. We will provide you an overview of each one of them, and who better than Eric to share with you the role of FDO's strategic planning. Thank you, Ismi. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners, Administrator Baker. Uh, again, Eric McClellan, and for the last eight years, I have served as FDNO's Director of Strategic Planning. Uh, the strategic planning team is 14 strong and comprises a broad uh, background of professionals including uh, a senior site planner, a planning technician, a pair of regulatory specialists, an art and public places administrator, an energy manager, and all seven of FDNO's fiscal complement. One of our core functions uh, is the long-range facility planning, and in this capacity, we develop FDNO's annual capital improvements plan, or CIP. During implementation of that plan, we're also responsible for regulatory compliance, which explains why you'll see me from time to time at planning and zoning meetings representing our application, site plans, interests, and other matters. We also engage in public outreach where we can anticipate or expect local interest in our approaching capital facility construction or facility operations. Also in the regulatory arena, we respond to manage and oversee indoor air quality, or IAQ, in our buildings. Uh, perform environmental testing and remediation of impacts such as mold, petroleum, lead, and other chemical constituents, as well as asbestos testing and abatement. Our financial professionals manage all of FDNO's funding. This includes development of our annual operating budget and responsibility for payables, reimbursements, collections, and related policies and procedures. We also support our internal technology systems and asset management. And last but not least, our Art and Public Places Administrator and Energy Manager are both a team of one besides myself in managing those facets of public facilities and their operations. To put some numbers to our team, in fiscal year 2022, we managed the department's capital budget of $77.3 million. We processed 1,428 payments for construction-related activity. We processed 7,463 payments for various services, tangible products, and supplies. We placed 498 encumbrances or contractual financial commitments into the Advantage financial system and received 230 responses to solicitations for art and public places. All this is to say there is hardly a planning endeavor, capital project, purchase, or funding commitment that doesn't pass without some strategic planning encounter. So with that, Ismi is going to turn attention to our business operations division. Thank you, Eric. So FDO's business operation division is a team of 23 individuals led by Brenda Sanashka. In this division, we house our business and community agreements manager, our contract evaluators, storeroom keepers, and business development functions, which include procurement. Business operation is a critical uh, function in researching, preparing, managing, and negotiating permits, contracts, and agreements for internal and external customers. For 
example, during the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic, business operations was tasked with managing and drafting the execution of the non-congregate sheltering agreements that were entered into with local hotels. They also handle all the agreements with local municipalities and partnering agencies for the use of the county's public safety radio system. Business operations runs FDO storerooms, which are necessary to sustain FDO facilities management division operations, and performs all procurement and vendor outreach for the department. In fiscal year 22, business ops managed 185 interlocal agreements, maintained over 300 solicitations, issued uh, 381 facility use permits, and maintained over 1,300 storeroom items. Next one down the line is FDO's Fleet Management Services Division, which has a personal complement of 59 colleagues and is led by Sarah Burnham. Our Fleet Division was recently recognized as uh, by the uh, National Association of Fleet Administrators as one of the top 100 fleets in the nation. Furthermore, I must take a moment to share with the board that Sarah is currently in Texas attending the Government Fleet Expo and Conference, where yesterday she was uh, recognized as the 2023 Public Sector Fleet Manager of the Year. Not only... <laughs> We're very proud of Sarah, as you can tell. And uh, not only is it being recognized uh, at a nationwide level, a major honor, um, my instinct tells me that there are not many females doing the type of work she does, uh, which I think is yet another testament to how unique the FDO team is. Fleet management services overseas, as you can imagine, the county's fleet and fuel services. It operates three shops, light, heavy, and specialized vehicles, and runs two regional shops at South County and Pahokee. Uh, in fiscal year 22, fleet managed uh, 15 fuel sites that are used by county departments, PBSO, some constitutional offices, and fire rescue. It maintained approximately 4,700 uh, 4, assets, of which approximately 2,500 are on-road vehicles. It also managed over 12,000 work orders while attaining a 98% positive customer service results. Facilities management is FDO's largest division with a personal complement of 168 positions and is led by Marco Singa. FDM, FMD, sorry, FMD provides services to all county owned and leased facilities and operates on a six region framework, each one of those regions led by a regional manager. In FMD, you will find our plumbers, our parking attendants, our electricians, irrigation technicians, and general maintenance mechanics just to name a few. In other words, all the trade type work required to keep buildings operational. Facilities management operates 24 seven and provides essential services such as custodial, pest control, and groundskeeping. In fiscal year 22, it handled over 41,000 work orders for a portfolio of over 800 buildings. FDO Street Electronic Services and Security Division is laid, led by Gilbert Morales and has a personal complement of 82 positions. As its name uh, suggests, ESS also handles billing systems, just the electronic kind. This division is responsible for access control, fire and intrusion, and radio systems. It also handles county security through in-house and contract security officers and those does so in close coordination with the sheriff's office. ESS manages the county's public, radio, public safety radio system, which supports all county emergency operations, fire rescue, and PBSO, and a total of 69 partnering agencies and municipalities. The system has 14 radio sites and almost 24,000 active radios. In fiscal year 22, ESS handled over 7,500 security access badges requests supported 81 access control sites, and conducted over 1,400 preventative maintenance inspections for fire and intrusion alarm systems. Next is FDO's Property and Real Estate Management Division. No one better than Perby to provide you an overview. Thank you, SME. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayors, Commissioners. Pervy Bugaida, Director for the Property and Real Estate Management Division, also known as PREM. My team of 10 colleagues and I serve as the professional advisors on all real estate related matters for Palm Beach County. 
We provide a full range of real estate services to our clients, which include the Board of County Commissioners, its departments, agencies, and the constitutional officers. The services PREM provides include the acquisition, disposition, and leasing of properties, coordinating civic site, civic site acquisitions, administering leases, and providing technical support for the development of county facilities. In fiscal year 22, we had, as of fiscal year 22, we have 2,582 county-owned real estate properties or core properties. We manage 225 active leases and special agreements and oversee 670 active easements. Most recently, we led the negotiations for the Peanut Island Lease Agreement and the University of Florida De Development and Conveyance Agreement. PREM is also responsible for issuing solicitations for concessions at our county parks and other facilities. Last, but certainly not least, is FDO's Capital Improvements Division. As you may recall, at the start of this presentation, I shared that FDO is one of the five construction departments that the county has. There are some uh, particularities related to that statement that I would like to highlight. As you know, the other construction departments, airports, water utilities, environmental resources management, and engineering and public works have very specialized missions. Therefore, they exercise their authority within uh, the limits of said mission. FDO, on the other hand, is the county's internal services provider. As a result of that, we are the one construction department that services all other departments and constitu constitutional offices. That is why you will see us covering a very broad uh, spectrum of projects, from general government offices to libraries to parks to PBSO substations, housing units, courthouses, and bo bus shelters. We do all type of projects to serve our customers. FDO's Capital Improvement Division is that team within FDO that leads project implementation. A total of 31 colleagues with Fernando Del Dago at the helm manage project procurement and implementation. Not surprisingly, capital improvement has a heavy workload. In fiscal year 22, it had a monthly average of over 600 open projects, once again covering a very broad spectrum from installing new electric vehicle chargers at the convention center to building the new supervisor of elections facility. In fiscal year 22, it received 241 requests for new uh, projects, and it completed 258 uh, ongoing projects. It is often said that a picture is worth a thousand words. Therefore, we would like to share with you a few examples of the projects we have recently completed and those that we have uh, underway. During the peak of the pandemic, FDO led the renovation of an existing facility to provide non-congregate sheltering services, which is now known as Melissa's Place Lake Village at the Glades. Then for Palm Tran, in 2021, we completed the renovation and expansion of its South, South County facility. Um, as you know, we led the negotiations with the University of Florida towards the execution of the development and conveyance agreement for the urban campus. And then in coordination with the Office of Resilience, we have co-led the implementation of the county's electric vehicle chargers pilot program with completed installations at the government center and the convention center garages. In 2021, we completed the renovation of the Wellington Library, and in 2022, phase one of the Canyon District Park commenced operations. Now, let's transition to some of our ongoing projects. The renovation of the PBSO headquarters building is approaching completion, and we expect the same will be effective in July of this year. We also have the renovation of the Roger Dean Chevrolet Stadium that is just commencing and should take approximately two years, as the same will be implemented in between spring training seasons. Fire Station 40 in the White Feather Trail area is a couple months shy of opening its doors. Uh, while Canyon Library is in full construction mode and should be completed in late spring 2024. The county's Homeless Resource Center number two, will, which will provide an additional 74 beds, is slated for completion this fall. Construction of Prosperity Village Cottage Homes, which will add 16 units of transitional housing, is full steam ahead and approximately a year out for completion. The procurement process to select the design professional that will assist us with Brooks subdivision project was just completed and this board will have an opportunity to consider the resulting contract during its June 13 regular meeting. 
the new supervisor of elections production facility continues to move ahead even after the impacts we had due to supply chain issues. We're currently tracking for substantial completion in December of 2023. Design for the build out of the main county courthouse, seventh and eighth floors is going well. And as recently as last week, we met uh, with the project team, courts administration and the chief judge to review uh, programming drawings. Selection of the architectural engineering firm that will assist us with the expansion of the medical examiner office uh, was completed earlier this month. Following contract negotiations, we expect to bring a contract for consideration by this board in the coming months. And then, as you know, we have been assisting environmental resources management with the acquisitions in the Palmar area and also managing the contract and all related transactions for the mixed use project that will be built on the county's uh, wedge uh, property. And then as a final example, uh, to close this list, we are actively working on the programming phase of the South County Administrative Complex Redevelopment Project. And we also continue to provide ongoing property search uh, services, such as the one for the future fire station 50. In a nutshell, as of April 2023, we had 546 act active capital projects, which translate into approximately 357 million and a projected five-year CIP of $481 million. In closing, FDO is here to serve those that serve Palm Beach County. Our team does so with much pride and great commitment. And it's certainly my honor to serve as the department director. We hope this presentation proved to be an efficient overview of who we are and what we do. This concludes our presentation and we will gladly take any questions. Thank you very much. Commissioner Bernard, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, let's see, on slide 29, it says you're only working on 546 active projects. I think we need to get it to 600. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> you can do it. You really can do it. I, I know that you can, so, um, but I, I know that um, this is a department that you've got a lot of employees and it's a lot of hard work and I commend you for the hard work and your entire staff uh, because I know it's a lot and we really thank you for, for everything that you do, your entire uh, employees that work for you. Thanks, it is me. Mr. Vice Mayor recognizes, or Ms. Vice Mayor. I just uh, wanna ditto exactly what Commissioner Bernard said. It's amazing um, and I've had your department uh, give talks at the uh, Tourist Development Council in terms of very complex contracts. And I'm so very proud to have you part of our Palm Beach County team, so ditto. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Anybody else, any questions? Well, let me just uh, share my own. Um, thank you for being here. Thanks for the excellent presentation, but more importantly, thank you and your amazing staff for all you do. Um, I will not second uh, Commissioner Bernard's comment on 600 projects, but I mean, I'm sure we could get there easily without a problem. But uh, it's an amazing, amazing work you all accomplish uh, on behalf of the citizens and businesses of Palm Beach County, so thank you. With that, I think we are coming to the end of our agenda. Um, I know, uh, let me just see, does any commissioner have any comments? Buddy, did you have something? I have, yes. Um, <clears throat> I just have a housekeeping item. Um, so we can do that at any time. That would be now. That would be a good time, do a little housekeeping here. Okay, I'd like to reappoint Lee Warren to the Infrastructure Surtax Independent Citizen Oversight Committee. There you go. Thank you. Duly noted. Right. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Woodward, and then we'll, we'll turn it over to our administrator. Thank you, Mayor. Um, on a much lighter note, I just wanted to remind everyone that sports in South Florida is still thriving with the Heat and the Panthers, 3-0, uh, and o, and hoping to get to their finals. So uh, tonight, tomorrow night, keep watching. Maybe it'll be done. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Administrator Baker, you're recognized. On an even happier note, um, Again, Sarah from 
our fleet division won the national award and we are extremely proud of her. Um, but in addition to that, Palm Beach County, and I wanna tell you before you find out elsewhere, but Palm Beach County uh, has been honored with 30 achievement awards uh, from the National Association of Counties. Wow. And in addition to that, to put the icing on the cake, our Youth Services Department won best in category and children and youth category for its enhanced monitor, uh, mentoring engagement level up program. So I am extremely proud of uh, staff and your support in allowing us to do these things. And so we're gonna put out a press release, we'll get this to you, but I just want you to know that um, we are proud to be uh, Team PBC here in Palm Beach County and we do work extremely hard to provide programs under your leadership to our residents here in Palm Beach County. Thank you. Thank you for and sharing. And I'd like to thank staff for all the hard work. Well deserved, well deserved. Thank you very much, uh, Administrator Baker. All right, is anything else for the good of the order? Not seeing any, uh, then this meeting is adjourned and we will see you all on Thursday. Very good, thank you. <clears throat>